So welcome to ProSBC, uh, an introduction and closer look. In October 2017, Telco Bridges took a bold step to offer FreeSBC, uh, a software-based session border controller product to the market. Since then, over 10 million sessions of FreeSBC software have been downloaded by thousands of users around the globe. Many of those sessions are now in production or various stages of evaluation. During that time, we at Telco Bridges have been listening carefully to customer feedback and working diligently on a product development roadmap to implement those suggestions. The result is ProSBC, an enhanced session border controller offering that fits many more use cases in both service provider and enterprise applications. Today, we're pleased to share with you an overview of ProSBC, explain its features, capabilities, target markets, and use cases. So let's get started. All right, so first, let, uh, a couple of introductions. Uh, I'm Alan Percy. I'm the Senior Director of Product Marketing for Telco Bridges, uh, covering their software products, and I'm today's event moderator. I'm joined today by Alain Brassard. He's the lead software engineer with the responsibility over the SBC products at Telco Bridges. Uh, and Alain, thanks for sharing your expertise today and joining us. Thanks, sir. I'm glad to be here today. All right, so let's talk about uh, today's agenda. So we've got a handful of things planned for today. Uh, we're gonna spend just a couple of minutes talking about some of the market trends. You know, we've been listening to our customers and evaluators. Uh, and we're gonna share some of that. Uh, then we're gonna talk about the positioning between free SBC and pro SBC. Uh, then we're gonna move on and talk about some of the new features that are introduced with this uh, new uh, pro SBC offering. We'll talk about some of the new use cases where it can be used. Uh, give you a peek at the planned roadmap, uh, and then talk about how you can join either the beta program or if you're listening to the recording, uh, how you can download your copy of Pro SBC. And of course, we'll close up with your questions. So lots to cover here today. All right, so a few trends in the SBC market um, that we're seeing. And I, um, I spent a lot of time with the analysts and with our customers and with some of the other software vendors. Uh, and I put together just a couple of quick slides. Well, first of all, uh, I think everyone recognizes that, you know, the days of selling, you know, giant, expensive, proprietary hardware SBCs is pretty much on the way out. Um, this was replaced maybe about 10 years ago or so with just selling software. Uh, and sort of, I found this picture, I kind of thought it was kind of funny, you know, it was the last time you saw a CD. But, um, the, you know, it was, um, you know, it, SBC software was sold. Uh, uh, standalone for use on COTS equipment and and uh, maybe with some specialized hardware blades or boards. Uh, but more recently, of course, it's moved to cloud and most recently to virtual network functions. And we're going to talk about how those virtual network functions fit into the uh, the bigger puzzle and, and how they work um, in the use cases. Um, we're also seeing a, a big trend from, uh, you know, the CapEx model, right, where you've licensed the software with a large CapEx expenditure with usually a maintenance fee. Roughly, usually, I think the industry standards are around 20% for a maintenance fee and support fee uh, to the pay-as-you-grow model. We heard over and over again, at least I did over the last 10 years, about startups who'd come to market, say, hey, listen, I want to offer this new service to my customers, software as a service to my customers. Uh, maybe I'm going to shoot for 10,000 initial uh, users, uh, but I, um, you know, I as I grow, I would like to increase, um, you know, increase my capacity. And coming up with a solution that allows these startup businesses to have a very low cost of entry to help them build their customer base and then grow their session border controller capability as their business grows um, through licensing and software and cloud technologies. Um, just came back over and over and over again. So um, this is something we address uh, with this with this platform, and we'll and we'll show how that happens. The other uh, more recent trend that we're seeing is the shift from the core to the edge of the network. Uh, the long, long time that the effort was to push everything into the core of the network, uh, leaving you know very little intelligence or anything at the edge uh, of the customer. Um, implementation and what we're, we've seen over the last handful of years is the use of universal CPE equipment and the Etsy network function virtualization technology to put 
that's a mouthful, virtual network function software out at the customer premise at the edge of the network. And this is, you can kind of think of this as just moving the smarts to the edge of the network, especially for the, any of the firewall, SD-WAN, uh, session border controller, edge protection technology. Um, this just makes all the difference in the world. And the metaphor I like to use is, you know, the, yes, the bank has a big, huge vault in the center of their branch, but the reality is they still lock the front door. Um, and this is really what this is all about, is moving the intelligence uh, and the security software to the edge of the network, to the front door. Uh, another trend we're seeing is, you know, certainly a few years ago, the emergence of the enterprise session border controller. Uh, the service providers have their SBCs in the core of their network, uh, and that's meant to manage traffic and protect their network from potential attack. But more and more enterprises are, are rightly figuring out that their network needs protection and they need to manage the traffic inside their network. Uh, the enterprise session border controller has a few functional differences and we actually um, have a whole separate presentation on that uh, particular topic, uh, talking about the specific features. But uh, you know, we're now seeing enterprises say, hey, listen, I need a session border controller to protect my network to provide um, traffic management and to do um, other uh, functions within their network, um, you know, in addition to what the service provider is providing. So um, again, this is driving some of the functional needs for the market. So this um, brings us to um, the introduction of uh, Pro SBC. And uh, you know, we did a press release uh, a few weeks ago, um, uh, giving a heads up to the market that this is coming and what our plans are for it. So uh, I thought we'd do is get into some of the details here. Well, let's just start with positioning. Um, first of all, it's important to understand that free SBC uh, and pro SBC will be kind of sister products. Um, maybe big sister, little sister is a way of thinking of it. We're going to continue to deliver free SBC to the market, and we've um, decided to position it uh, to a certain uh, part of the market, focused on the tier two and tier three service providers and small and medium business. Uh, we see it working in access and peering applications, uh, in the uh, especially in the open source communities, where uh, applications like Asterisk and FreeSwitch and uh, others like that uh, really can benefit from a session border controller that's very low cost. Uh, we see it being used in educational programs uh, where um, telecommunication applications are being built by students, uh, you know, graduate students and in, in experimentation uh, where they need something, you know, obviously very affordable, like free, um, to be able to build on with some basic features. Um, continue to make it very easy to download and use. One of the um, challenges uh, that the market suffered from is a lot of the open source software is very complex uh, and takes a level of expertise that um, if you're trying to uh, build an educational program or open source application, uh, it, you know, it's, it, it's a time sink to work on some of those. And, and one of the benefits we're hearing from our customers is that free SPC is very easy to, easy to use and very easy to implement. Beyond that, um, we're expecting FreeSBC to continue uh, to benefit from the community support. Uh, that's on our uh, both our wiki and our forum, uh, where uh, users are helping each other, and uh, uh, the community you know helps itself. And of course, it'll continue to be free uh, with an annual renewal. Uh, and that's just um, you know once a year you need to check in, and um, you know, check in with us and we will extend the license and there's an online process for that. So what is Pro SBC? Well, we've um, changed the target market. Um, this is targeted more towards, you know, the, the you know, the complete complement of uh, tier one through three service providers. Uh, and we're also seeing uh, positioning this for use in enterprise applications. Uh, obviously still access and peering, but software as a service is a big addition and um, some others. We're also uh, expecting it to be used in commercial applications. Right? Whenever there is uh, you know, a service provider who's running uh, paid services, or you know, the expectation, of course, is that they would like to have good quality support uh, from the manufacturer, and that um, by licensing Pro SBC, uh, they would get all that. Also, we've added encryption and HA support. We're gonna get into some of those details and what that includes. 
uh, with Pro SBC. Uh, and of course it comes with live support uh, from Telco Bridges and there's the option of getting 24 seven uh, support for um, those highly critical applications. And lastly, uh, Pro SBC, we're positioned at a dollar per session per year with, you know, dot, 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 there's some, you know, some qualifiers, right? There's a, there's a max per server and there's a few other uh, add-ons uh, as part of that too. So that's the key difference between the two positionings. Uh, let's look at the details of some of the features. And this is Elaine, I'm gonna have you help out with some of these here. Um, we're gonna start, okay, first sure. of all, let me just cover the, you know, the, the, the basic features that both free SBC and pro SBC share. Uh, and top of the list, of course, is the back-to-back -back user agent, which has the benefit of topology hiding uh, for SIP and media. And this is um, a core function of a session border controller. Uh, both of the products offer that. Uh, capability. Um, moving on then, uh, the, the, you know, denial of service, den distributed denial of service attack actually turns out, you know, registration, flooding, these kinds of things. Uh, protection from those uh, with white and black listing features is included in both. Uh, routing and load balancing engine, uh, the ability to be able to, you know, intelligently route based on either dialed number or, dot, uh, or calling number. Uh, based on prioritization, uh, any one of those can um, be used to um, route calls um, and traffic within the network. Uh, and then SIP header manipulation and mediation. And this is where you know, SIP messages need, for whatever purpose, a, um, a fix up, right? There's a, sometimes there's a little dial plan fix that needs to happen. Sometimes it's a little bit more dramatic. Uh, correction, we've seen customers use it to substitute calling and called number uh, for, um, for outbound calling campaigns, for example. Uh, there's quite a few other things. And of course, those, all those features included in both FreeSBC and ProSBC. Now the fun begins. Where, what does ProSBC include going forward? Well, what I've done is just summarize just the, in, the high level packs. And, at a different time, a different place, and on our website, we'll eventually detail out exactly what all this, what this um, is, entails. But um, as a start, the media pack, and this is a media bypass, uh, the ability to do transcoding one codec to another, and media playback and record. And uh, Elaine, just real quick, maybe just talk about media bypass, so the difference between uh, uh, landing media on the SBC and bypass, I think it might be good to just mention. Yeah, sure. Um, in some cases, the, uh, the SBC's role in the network is uh, simply to, uh, to make uh, route SIP calls, do some header manipulations, but the, the two remote devices trying to connect, communicate with each other, they are on the same network, or at least they're able to send RTP or ODO directly between each other, which will uh, uh, significantly reduce the amount of you know, traffic and network on the SBC and reduce network costs. So this is a feature for the, for the pro SBC allowing to bypass the SBC for the media whenever possible. Yeah, and I think one of the really important use cases is when somebody is putting the SBC in the cloud, right? Any one of these um, public cloud services, if there's a way you can eliminate the, the uh, media traffic going through it, I think it saves quite a bit of money. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, next is the analytics pack. This is um, a combination of some of the tools necessary to analyze network issues, uh, call trace, uh, to be able to initiate test calls, to be able to do test recordings of calls. Um, and so maybe Elaine, do you have any example of the, the kinds of things you can do with the analytics pack? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm sure everyone that has ever installed a telecommunication system here would agree with me. It it generally does, does generally doesn't work the first uh, on the first try. It's uh, there's always thing to test and thing to tweak and uh, IP addresses to change or uh, networks routes to uh, adapt and before it works properly. And and when you have a tool like ProSBC that offers uh, the analytic packs pack, it will make this processing much more easier with the uh, GUI uh, traces of uh, the call flows and so we can see easily. Uh, all incoming outgoing calls, the parameters, the options, what happens and why it doesn't work. Uh, also the test call option will allow to test, uh, to make test calls from the SVC directly to test route 
test the uh, header manipulations, the routing scripts, and uh, different options like that that ma will make uh, building and uh, having a system working properly much quicker. Yep. Uh, call recording and also uh, network recording also, uh, allows to um, identify which part of the network is causing problems, if there's audio problems, uh, or if there is a packet uh, loss, uh, the network capture will uh, help a lot to discover where the problem lies. Yeah. Great tools, they're, um, I think they're widely used in implementation, so those are pretty yeah. powerful tools. Yeah. Next is the uh, API and connector pack, and this is basically the ability to connect into some, of the, you know, either collect CDRs, you know, call detail rec record records, uh, or the radius interface for authentication, and also our stir shaken interface. And this we covered in one of the previous webinars with one of our partners. TransNexus is a, is a method of be able to either add or uh, validate uh, uh, shaken identity tokens. Um, as part of um, as part of uh, you know stomping out the robocall problem, and we're going to talk about the encryption pack in much more detail in a couple of slides. So only hold, skip over that, uh, and then high availability and standalone survivability are um, some of the newer capabilities. So high availability has been part of the solution for a while um, with doing call switchover, uh, having two SBCs work together, and if one fails, um, the second one takes over. Um, it's uh, um, we have some enhancements coming on that HA transfer, but maybe sp speak a moment. Just talk a little bit about the standalone survivability, uh, and that's a new feature that um, probably deserves its own webinar someday. Yeah, sure. Um, this feature, the standalone survivability, is used uh, can be used, for example, in enterprise networks where there's a lot of uh, phones on the LAN inside the building or inside the, the enterprise and they're connecting to the to the service provider or to the internet through the SBC and let's uh, suppose uh, at some point the internet connection to the service provider or the internet is going down uh, the enterprise would not want the, the internal phones to be down all at once so at least we the SBC will be able to provide a service so that users inside the building would still be either be able to call each other until the uh, internet connection is reestablished so this is kind of rerouting the calls internally when the uh, service provider is down. So it's a maybe a, a little miniature proxy that's built in, into the device, into the software. Yeah, kind of, yeah. Yep. Another thing that we're in, initiating with uh, 3.1 is um, some scaling limitations. And this is, um, uh, we're, you know, we're implementing some adjustments to the number of network access points and the maximum number of uh, device registrations. Uh, with FreeSBC 3.1, uh, um, that software and the licenses that come with it are going to limit the number of network access points to five and the maximum number of uh, endpoint registrations to 25. Uh, the Pro SBC will uh, have uh, up to 1,024 network access points and, and support up to 350,000 endpoint registration. So this is kind of drives that difference in the in the target markets we talked about a few slides before. It's going to enforce that um, as we go forward. Uh, moving on then support, of course, as we mentioned earlier, the uh, support for the free SBC is a community, uh, whereas um, with Pro SBC you'll get live support from Telco Bridges and there's a couple of options on that support front. And lastly, of course, the cost, which um, I think we covered before is um, a dollar per session for Pro SBC with some caveats and et cetera. So let's move on. Let's talk about um, and get down into the nitty gritty with um, SIP over TLS and SRTP. And so, Elaine, I'm going to have you kind of uh, walk us through here. Um, I've got what I've done here in the diagram is I've got a remote endpoint. I just, you know, I got a, maybe an IP phone at a, either a remote office or a home office. Uh, and then I've got an application server on the right-hand side. Um, so kind of maybe walk us through what happens with SIP over TLS uh, with the SBC, and then we'll talk about the media separately. Yeah, sure. So um, any SIP call has two, two different paths uh, associated with it. There's the signaling path, which is used to establish the call, which is the SIP protocol. And there, there's the uh, audio path, uh, which is made from RTP packets. 
And um, first of all, the, the, the SIP protocol can be used over TLS connections, which makes the connections between the point-to-point -point connections secure by using public certificates and uh, sim uh, asymmetrical uh, encryption. Th this will allow the two devices communicating with each other to do authentication, so making sure that the remote party is exactly who we we pretends to be, and also encrypt the content of the, uh, the, the, the uh, packets exchanged between the two devices. So that means that the SIP calls and all the negotiation, the uh, phone numbers, the, uh, all the user information are being encrypted between the remote endpoint and the SBC. Of course, uh, to be able to route the calls, the SBC has to be able to decrypt the information and have access to the SIP message itself, so the routing can, can take place. But the SBC is going to make sure to re-encrypt the message with the other side of the network so that no SIP message can be decrypted anywhere on the, any side, either side of the network. In some cases also, the SBC could be relaying a secure call on one side to a unsecure call on the other side. For example, if the SBC would be on the border of a service provider's uh, network. So one side could be the internet or public network, requires encryption. And the other side may be the, the LAN of the service provider, which is secure already, so it might not be necessary to encrypt the calls on that side. And that, that's uh, for a SIP, secure SIP over TLS. Now for SRTP, um, there's one little difference between SRTP and TLS. SRTP is using uh, symmetrical encryption keys, which, which are generated per SIP call, and they're random keys, and they're exchanged within the SIP messages. So we understand here that it's important when you, we want to use secure RTP that we also have a secure SIP calls to make sure that these RTP um, encryption, encryption keys are um, exchanged between devices in a secure manner. And once what the SBC is uh, able to do here is doing what we call the path through, which, uh, which allows the, the uh, both remote devices to, to uh, well, the SBC will forward the uh, private encryption keys from one side to the other, and then we only have to, to pass the RTP packets through uh, from one side to each other. This is the, more, the most efficient way of doing a SRTP relay, meaning the SBC doesn't have to encrypt or decrypt the RTP payload, and though it's, but it's still able to route the RTP packets uh, by the, the way the RTP protocol has been designed. Uh, in other cases, it might be uh, the SBC could uh, in cases where one of the remote devices does not support secure RTP, the SBC would be able to generate a, um, a random encryption key on behalf of this device that does not support encryption, and then having one side of the net network encrypted and the other side unencrypted. So the SBC would act, yeah. act here as the um, encry encry encryption yeah. proxy. A little graphic here for that, which is where uh, Pro SBC uh, would now decrypt or encrypt um, the packet, so it's RTP on one side and SRTP on the other side. That's that's exactly yeah. right, right. And you know, when we get to the roadmap, we'll talk about the, you know, those differences and, and when they get introduced. So the um, the anyway, so they um, moving on then. Let's talk about you know the configuration and impact of this. You know, from an outward standpoint, the only real significant difference a user would see is in the configuration screens. Um, there's some new area of configuration with uh, above and beyond what used to be available, uh, configuring the certificates and the TLS pro, uh, profiles. And of course, on our wiki, we have a whole detailed description of how to use those configuration settings uh, and proper, proper settings for the new uh, SIP over TLS uh, functionality. Okay, anything else to add on that, Elena? No, not for now. Okay, <laughs> good, good, good. All right, so now um, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the new platform options. Um, you know, based on your feedback, customer feedback and uh, recommendations from customers, uh, you know, FreeSBC supported, um, you know, initially supported on Intel, bare, Intel bare metal servers, uh, VMware, KVM, OpenStack, virtualization platforms, and we added uh, AWS cloud support uh, last year. And um, more uh, as part of the Pro SBC launch, we're adding a, a couple of new platforms. One of them is we're adding Azure, uh, and we've got a handful of beta customers now running their software uh, on Azure, and this is um, based on you know their need to, uh, to implement an SBC in the cloud. And when we get to the use cases, we'll see where that fits in. 
Uh, also, too, we're um, working more often with uh, virtual network functions on universal CPE equipment. Uh, and we've already validated with Sienna and published uh, that actually last fall, uh, a press release in our validation with Sienna and their 3906. And um, more recently with Telco Systems and their UCPE platform uh, delivering um, a session border control that can be put at the edge of a service provider network. So there's a few new platform options with Pro SBC as they go along. Um, so there's some licensing changes, um, as we sort of hinted before, with um, the new 3.1 version. Uh, first of all, uh, FreeSBC again, you, know, you, you can register, you can download the software and get a key. Uh, there is an annual re-registration process required. We want to make sure you're still out there uh, and we have current contact information. Uh, we've implemented a five free license um, uh, limit uh, on just on the automatic download. After that limit, you'd have to reach out and contact our salespeople and talk to them about your use case and why you need more than five. Uh, we've got a handful of customers who offer uh, free SPC bundled with their evaluation software and they need uh, a lot of free licenses and that's fine. Uh, we just need to know what the use case is and be able to uh, enable uh, more than five. Uh, and it's of course to prevent abuse. Pro SBC uh, is going to have a very different uh, registration download process from what was previously done with FreeSBC and FreeSBC Pro Edition. Uh, and that is now we're shifting it to you can register and download the software and we're going to give you a 90 day temporary key to use all the features of uh, Pro SBC. Uh, and during that 90 day window, uh, you would need to go to the online store uh, or engage with our salespeople. Uh, to pay for license for that software. And of course, at that time when you pay for it, you select you know, the duration of your license and, the, and of course the number of sessions you'd like to have purchased. Um, with this, that process of using the store, our sales engagement goes into the license server and sets those settings uh, within your license. Uh, then you'd of course go through a process of refreshing the license within this, in the software, which is just a simple little click. Uh, and then um, you check in with us annually um, to update the, uh, the license, right? Pay for the next year, for example, uh, maybe change the number of sessions you would like to use on an annual basis. Uh, or you can do it more frequently. If you, you know, if, say in six months, you need another 100 sessions, you could certainly uh, go online, use your license key and add another 100 sessions or reach out to our salespeople that can help you with that. Uh, one thing that is different is um, if you don't, um, purchase the key uh, after the 90-day window or if you let it expire at the end of the year, um, the expiration of the key, the, the software will revert back to free SBC. Uh, and if your one-year evaluation window has closed, um, uh, the free SBC software um, will, will stop operating. So you need to, would need to go back online and just do a, um, a registration to get it going again. Um, it's, and what's critical about this is we need to know who to reach out to to make sure that your license doesn't expire on you in the middle of the night uh, and surprise anybody. So that's why it's so important to have an annual license um, updates and you know valid email address for all that. All right, so a little different from before. Uh, this is what we think is a little bit easier for folks to kind of work their way through, download the software, you've got 90 day window uh, to get it up and running and, uh, and then uh, make your payment. All right, so let's talk about use cases. Um, a couple of hand, handful of new use cases that the that Pro SPC can now handle. One of them is these um, software as a service platforms. You know, we've gotten a lot of feedback from the software as a service uh, application developers, and they're building all kinds of great applications: conferencing, uh, gaming, uh, contact center, unified communications, IPPBX. It's all over the place, and they need an architecture that gives them uh, the option of doing um, SIP over TLS uh, and SRTP out to their customers because their customers are either work at home or remote locations over the internet. Uh, and they want to be able to have uh, Pro SBC either sitting in their cloud infrastructure, for example, here on a VMware platform, uh, but it could be you know, any one of the other platforms we talked about. Uh, and then using uh, the decryption function to be able to deliver unencrypted calls to the contact center or whatever the applications they're working with. 
uh, they want to offload that encryption effort to the uh, to the session border controller. And the critical features and functions that they're using, of course, are the you know denial service and DDoS protection, the encryption decryption support, managing traffic. You know, the, usually when they scale up at a certain point, they need multiple application servers uh, and be able to spread that load across those um, those servers. Uh, and in, in some cases, of uh, routing and SIP mediation functions, be able to you know send calls based on, for example, you know the called number, the application they're trying to reach. Uh, off to a different server uh, or making some manipulation to the SIP header uh, because the endpoint device is, is, um, needs a little massage. So this is a, a pretty common use case that um, we're now going to be able to support with, the, uh, with Pro SBC. Another is um, a uh, use case that we're starting to see a, a lot, a fairly common in the unified communication as a service platforms and specifically hint, hint, Microsoft, uh, where there's a, um, Skype for Business and their Teams platform, is the need to be able to bring SIP trunks in to a cloud infrastructure uh, to do um, either some, you know, obviously some protection, but also some encryption work that needs to be done to then deliver it to the application. And again, you know, we've seen a, a number of different applications here, which then would the application would deliver over the internet to the users um, and this architecture, if you hold this up and we're to look at the Microsoft's web page, you would say, aha, I know what they're doing. They're <laughs> working on trying to get this going with Microsoft. And we are feverishly working to get this architecture fit, uh, ready to go for Microsoft. And we've got some partners of ours who are helping us with some testing uh, to get this um, ready to go uh, for the Teams environment. So um, again, you know, routing, mediation, CDR functions, uh, media bypass is a critical piece. They, um, they don't want the media to go through the cloud infrastructure. Uh, so there's a, a handful of uh, important features for this use case too. Okay, so another one is um, the, uh, something we've been talking about for the last, I don't know, six, eight months, our intelligent edge strategy. And I wanted to share this too. This is where uh, as I hinted earlier, that um, uh, service providers and large enterprises see the value of pushing functions like SD-WAN or session border controller or firewall or obviously routing functions to the edge of their network. And uh, how they plan on doing this is through the use of universal CPE equipment and uh, virtual network functions. And we're beginning to see, um, you know, definitely some trends in the industry that this is um, this is picking up steam. Uh, and so what this diagram shows here is, um, you know, various different remote branches from, um, let's say, either a central office or it could be a, a enterprise cloud. Uh, and what they're doing is they're putting this um, equipment uh, on site, and then they're loading various VNFs. In this particular example here, we're using um, showing a Fortinet SD WAN software package and uh, Pro SBC is the session border controller out of the remote. The SD-WAN and or the firewall functions are managing the traffic for the data users and the voice users, you know, the hosted IP PBX users would go through the SBC uh, before it um, lands back into the cloud. Uh, and of course this requires a couple of functions, uh, some work on our part, one of them is doing the interoperability testing with the SD-WAN and, and other VNF providers. Uh, and some validation and, and performance testing with the universal CP equipment vendors. As I hinted earlier, you know, we've been working with Sienna and with Telco Systems um, to, to bring together, you know, some very specific details on what the capacity of that equipment is, which is, uh, this seems to be um, kind of a neat one. And the last um, use case is um, we're now starting to see CPaaS providers, uh, you know, we're, we're beginning to see these applications scale and a couple of, a couple of interesting use cases. One of them is, is that um, organizations are going to a CPaaS provider like Twilio or, or using RESTCOM from Telestacks or there's a handful of others and they're beginning to build their applications on those platforms, but they want to bring their own SIP trunks. They don't want to use Twilio SIP trunks uh, or in the case of Telestacks, it's a service provider who wants to offer this. Uh, and or they're looking at um, protecting this platform from a telephony denial of service attacks, right? Those high volume call dialers that can slam a system and choke it. 
So what they're um, what they're asking for is an SPC that can run on the cloud. In this particular case here, it's either AWS or Azure um, to front end from maybe a customer's existing SIP trunks um, through the SPC. Maybe do some SIP header manipulation, uh, do some you know DOS DDoS protection, maybe. Um, doing some routing functionality to spread the load across multiple uh, platforms. And then in the um, hosted platform, whether it be, you know, again, Twilio or Telesax, whatever it might be, uh, to deliver those calls um, to the CPaaS platform. And from there, then they can use the platform to do applications that either do telephony outbound calls going the other direction, or they can use, uh, you know, drive mobile user experiences out at the, um, end customer. And there's a handful of things that were required for this. Obviously, the intelligent call routing, uh, the cloud hosted to be able to put it in AWS or Azure, uh, interoperable SIP trunking, the fully qualified domain name mapping, which was a feature we kind of skipped over real quick, but it's a, a recent addition. Uh, and um, also the media bypass function that Elaine described earlier. So um, it turns out to be a pretty popular new use case we're going to be able to address. So quick, let's just talk about the roadmap. Um, we've got a, a published roadmap that we're going to share here with you. Uh, and this is um, where we are at this point, of course, is um, the midpoint of the year almost, right? Um, so the, um, the FQDN and, and, uh, and SIP over TLS, uh, we put into beta back in, um, I think, March timeframe, something like that, Elaine? I think it was a little bit yes, earlier. Yes, I yeah. think that's about, yep. about it, yeah. Uh, and more recently added the SRTP relay, the Azure support, and um, we're just putting the finishing touches in the beta on a standalone survivability. Um, early this next quarter, we'll be um, adding the SRTP software encryption decryption capabilities, uh, and then doing some enhancements to HA software transcoding for DTMF, uh, and then some SIPREC functionality. This is sort of our published roadmap at this point. Um, lots of other little tiny things that um, are customer specific that we just obviously didn't include here. And of course, this is a little bit subject to change based on uh, projects that pop up. Uh, but this gives you a look at some of the things that are coming from Pro SBC. And these are all new features and functions that will only um, be delivered as part of Pro SBC. A couple other things we got cooking. Uh, one of them is um, we've your, based on your customer feedback, we've heard, you know, the, um, what's the statement is we love your, uh, the powerful capabilities of the GUI, uh, but for new users really would make it easy if we could have some kind of configuration wizard that would help them through the process. And so um, we've uh, come up with the idea of on our website that we would have a configuration wizard to be web-based. On our website, you select a use case, answer a handful of questions, and it would kick out a SPC configuration template, which in some instructions how to upload it to the SPC. And from that point, the final configuration would be done on the SPC. Um, and this is, um, you know, be integrated in part of our wiki experience uh, to make things a little bit easier. So we'll be working on this this next second half of the year um, to help um, make things even easier than it already is. Uh, and also, too, we're getting some feedback about, you know, we really love the fact that it's a hardware or software only product, uh, but you need help choosing the hardware platforms. And we, so we've certainly done some testing with the various hardware platforms, but we haven't been real good about publishing uh, the capacities and, and results of that. And hardware constantly changes, as we know. So we're going to make a little uh, concerted effort to deliver a hardware certification program uh, with um, various hardware platforms both the COTS hardware and universal CPE, uh, and we'll post a list of this tested hardware platforms on our website, and then we'll have uh, detailed instructions on how to use it or, you know, what do you call it, the tips and tricks kind of thing uh, over on the wiki. And it'll help make um, things go a little bit smoother for our integrators, uh, including purchase instructions, maybe the best, you know, places that we found it on, on the web. Um, so hopefully that'll make life a little easier. Uh, of course, we continue to work on uh, the interoperability portfolio. Uh, this is um, you know, a snapshot of just some of the uh, software platforms that are part of our alliance program. Uh, we add one or two every month, 
uh, with some of our software partners are um, you know, validating and testing with us. Um, we just um, added RESTCOM from Telestax uh, and a few others, and we'll have to squeeze this chart a little bit more to squeeze a little bit tighter and get more, squeeze some more people in. But this list continues to grow um, literally week by week, month by month, as we go uh, more and more people working with either free SBC or, or now pro SBC. So um, if you're on the call live, you're probably wondering, how do I get into the beta program? If you're listening to the recorded one, this may be moot because we'll be GA. Uh, but uh, what we've done is we've put a little banner on the freesbc.com slash pricing page uh, that is a point of entry. If you would like to be involved in the beta program, you'll be able to go uh, to freesbc.com slash pricing and you'll find this little learn more button. If you want to click on that, fill out the little form that uh, we'd be happy to have you join us in the beta program or get early uh, copies of the GA software. Uh, when we finally go GA with the software, of course, we'll move it down uh, to the regular standard packages uh, to the you know to the lower half of that pricing page and um, you can order it off of there. So um, making it pretty easy for you to join in and why not give it a try? It um, should be fairly painless. All right. So we, um, we came up with a handful of anticipated questions uh, based on some of the feedback we got. So let's just quick go through some of these. Elaine, I'm going to have you help out with some of these. So, yeah, sure. um, so someone's using FreeSBC 3.0 today and what happens to them? So maybe you can give a little description of what happens to somebody with uh, 3.0. Well, first of all, uh, FreeSBC 3.0 continues to exist. So the existing customers can still continue to use it. So there's no, uh, we, we don't force anyone to update to FreeSBC 3.1. Great. Okay. Uh, and I think, um, you know, it, it, they just can continue to use it. They just have to do their um, uh, registration. Yep. Um, so if somebody, um, how, do, how do they upgrade from 3.0 to 3.1? What's the process like to do an upgrade from 3.0 to 3.1? It's, uh, it's pretty easy. It's almost as easy as updating from one version to 3.0 to another, which meaning just upload the package on the web portal of the SBC. And the one added step compared to a minor update, which is to uh, upload a new license for the 3.1 release and then at any once the package and the license are uploaded at any time at convenience the uh, sbc can be switched to the new package and can also be re re reverted back to 3.0 if anything any problems happens with 3.1 great yeah it's pretty straightforward yeah well and but roughly how much time does it take start to start to finish well it can take a couple of minutes uploading the package depending on the connection speed yep. and switching the package to from 3.0 to 3.1 is a matter of uh, less than, than a minute. Yeah, so it's just a, a few minutes to do the upgrade. Yeah, 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 sure. Good. Okay, and another one that popped up uh, is uh, that someone's paid for the FreeSBC Pro Edition, so they paid for support for FreeSBC. What happens to me? So, Well, I am, anybody using FreeSBC Pro Edition is going to be able to upgrade to Pro SBC at no cost, so that's... Yeah. Basically, yeah, very, straightforward. Yeah, very straightforward. Uh, and of course, we made that very easy for those people that have already paid. Um, so I'm going to move on to just some general Q and A. And again, I think see, we've gotten some questions have worked in here. But just as a reminder, you can pose your question. Just use the Q and A panel in the upper left hand corner of your screen. And so we've got a handful here. So um, Rayberg's interested in ice and ice light. So Elaine, you want to maybe just address that real quick as to? Yeah, sure. Um, as of now, we, we don't have support for ICE protocol in, in the FreeSBC, though uh, we have uh, other meta methods of uh, making sure NAT traversal is, is working properly. As ICE is used to uh, when users are behind net NATs or routers which hide their private IP from the internet. So uh, with the FreeSBC, as long as the FreeSBC uh, is, uh, is on a fixed public IP address, we can address any uh, NAT traversal problem. Uh, problem from the customer side, user side, or the SBC side with the uh, other options that we may discuss uh, offline. All right. 
Yeah, and I, and Ray, Ray Burke, I would love to learn about your your need for ice and ice light. Um, I suspect maybe it might have something to do with teams, but I'd love to hear specifically what it is. So let's um, reach out afterwards. Also, Rayberg also asked a question about um, CPU-based transcoding, and I think we showed in the roadmap, but maybe, maybe just Elaine, you could just explain real quick, sort of the step-by-step -step process, um, the difference between the hardware and software, and what the first step is for the software-based transcoding. Yeah, sure. So right now we have what we call the hardware transcoding, which is a hardware unit that is going to that needs to be installed along the uh, the FreeSBC, and that handles the codec transcoding as required. And uh, we are working on integ integrating that into the software SBC so, so that uh, it can be uh, put on a virtual environment or within the SBC itself. So the first step of that is of course, including the uh, encryption, the SRTP encryption within the free SBC. And then later in the, in the year, we're gonna in integrate also transcoding for audio codecs into the SBC and DTMF translations. Right, yeah, probably the most common we run into is the need to decode DTMF in the audio and turn it back into SIP info messages or, or you know, out of band messages. So that's gonna be first. Yep, sure. Yep. Uh, and so next question here is, uh, um, are we gonna be offering classroom-based training on free SBC, pro SBC? Um, I, I, we, I, we do, we have all, um, we have been offering this as part of our professional services offering from the support team. Uh, and um, I think if you send an email to support at telcobridges.com with what your needs are, you can certainly get a um, get a quote on on where that's where that can be arranged. Um, I know um, I know Luke and his team have been um, shooting around the world doing the training all along, so we'd be happy to help with that. Uh, so the next question from Francisco is uh, about live support. How is um, how I guess maybe an overview of what is live support. So I don't know, Elaine, I know this is not really in your wheelhouse, but um, uh, since you're uh, closer to it, maybe you wanna just give a quick description of uh, how the support organization works. Yeah, we have people uh, around the, wor the world here making sure that we, uh, we can answer uh, any questions by uh, email or chat uh, through uh, working hours, and we also have the 24-7 uh, support options, which can be purchased separately from FreeSBC, which allows uh, uh, live support on phone at any time of the day or the night, any right. day of the week. Yep. We have a dedicated support team. They're excellent. They are very good, and they're giving, giving a super, they're doing super job of uh, helping everyone uh, by phone or by, uh, by email. Right, and just a point of clarification, that support group is only available, going forward, that, that support will only be available for pro SBC um, subscribers. Uh, again, free SBC will be um, based on community support. Okay, um, so media bypass. Um, does pro SBC use uh, RTCP to gather media analytics in media bypass? And since the media is not, yeah, it'll be interesting. It's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, right, right now, of course, if the media bypass feature is used, as the neither the RTP or RTCP packets are going through the SBC, and uh, and obviously the SBC will not be able to provide uh, media analytics or MOS right. or qual network quality indications. Um, so that's uh, if if you want the SBC to, to be doing media analytics, then we need to have the the media going through the SBC. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, the RTCP is mixed in with the with the pay, media payload. So, okay. Um, David asked a question about XML routing uh, API calls um, from the SBC. So, uh, are XML routing API calls yeah. from the SBC still blocking? Exactly um, he's asking there. Maybe you do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what this reference is. This is reference, re referencing to, but we do have um, um, APIs to connect to external routing systems through RADIUS protocol, which are non-blocking. So uh, there are alternatives to uh, to make routing systems uh, to, to connect the FreeSBC with external routing systems in a non-blocking manner. Yeah, good. Uh, David also asked, well, David's got a lot of questions here. So David also asked, what is the current status of HA and AWS? And of course, we're at this at this point, we um, we don't support HA in the AWS environment. 
And Elaine, maybe it would be wise to explain why. You know, what, what what's the hiccup with AWS and why is it hard to do uh, each, or not hard, but it's very difficult to do uh, yeah. uh, HA in the AWS environment. Yeah. The, one of the key elements of the FreeSBC HA is the ability to move the IP address from one SBC to the backup SBC, which is very convenient because remote equipments don't have to be aware that the uh, that there's a switchover that occurs on the SBC side. So uh, and and on AWS, unfortunately, the IP addresses uh, are different on each uh, on each uh, each SBC or each instance of a uh, host on the uh, the system. So there are APIs that we can integrate to to move IP addresses. Then we have not the, not done yet than this yet so uh, at some point we might support full HA on AWS but not uh, not today yeah and David obviously would love to know, better understand the use case and maybe we could help prioritize and make that happen uh, and he asked another question about HA about licenses for the um, for the HA unit and um, right in one of the benefits of, of pro SBC is that with each standard license you buy you get an you automatically get an HA license so you do not need to buy a second license for the ha unit um if you do this obviously at vmware or, or bare metal or whatever and you want to have a redundant unit it actually uses the same license as the primary a backup unit uses the same license as the primary so you um they are shared between the two okay um so uh sandeep asked the question is there any certification for pro sbc uh, and right now, we, we, I mean, if I, I'm assuming from a training standpoint, um, we do not have an official formal training certification for Pro SBC. Although, if you become proficient and share a case study with us, we will send you a gold star. <laughs> no, but uh, obviously, uh, I'm happy to help someone with their education process with some professional services hours um, and training. And of course, we can leave you with um, that as a validation on, on your training, which is great. So, um, and of course, we then another method is we do have quite a bit of online material and uh, materials on the wiki that can help. So, um, so question about Pro SBC integrate with Fusion PBX, and that's a new one on me. I don't recall seeing Fusion PBX as part of our interops running. Elaine, have you run into that at all? No, I, I don't have anything to, to. I don't know anything about this PBX. Yeah, so, uh, I don't either. Most most PBX use standard SIP messaging, so uh, there's a good good chances that it would work right out of the yeah. box. So we didn't test that. Yeah, it, it doesn't ring a bell either. So Sandy, again, you know, reach out to us. Um, we'd love to we'd love to hear about your use case and and see uh, if we can help you with that. Uh, it's maybe part of the beta. Uh, and David also asked a question. Notes on uh, AWS or VM based um, calls per second scaling of uh, figures. And so we've been publishing some of those numbers in the wiki, and of course it's all over the place, right? There's these are all different platforms. Um, but um, AWS, I think at this point, we've got pretty well documented, and I believe there's content on the, on the wiki about that. Um, any other thoughts on that, Elaine? Um, yeah, um, on the calls per second uh, scaling question, um, there's, there's no real difference in this area between uh, virtual or physical hosts here, whether either it is AWS, VM, or bare metal. Uh, there, there's going to be limitations on the network bandwidth or number of packets per second, per second where FreeSBC will, in all, almost any case, reach the limits of the uh, virtual network. But for the yeah. cost per second, it's, uh, it depends on the size of the host, number of CPUs. But it, there's no much difference between VM, cloud, or bare metal. Yeah. Uh, so Dave is also asking a question about um, RTP. Uh, is production is anyone in production with RTP proxying on AWS? Um, do we use D, uh, DPDK in, in that environment? Got a clue on that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, we uh, we we are using uh, DPDK and FreeSBC, which uh, allows FreeSBC to uh, almost always reach the uh, network limit of the. Uh, under underneath the infrastructure, for example, in AWS, yes, uh, FreeSBC is going to go as fast as the uh, network allows. Under uh, and, and this depends on the size of the host. I think AWS yes, the allow different network bandwidth based on the size of the host that is being chosen. Yeah. 
Great. Good. Uh, and then uh, we'll do one last question here. Uh, Sandeep asked a question of any hardware requirements to install Pro SBC. And um, you know, the, the hardware requirements, I think we got pretty well spelled out on the website for, mm -hmm. for free SBC applies executive Pro SBC. I don't know, anything else to add, Elaine? Uh, basically, uh, we, there's uh, some requirements on the network uh, adapters, the uh, network cards that need to be compatible with DPDK. Other than that, uh, it's, uh, any server that runs uh, Linux uh, should be generally fine for that, for, for running FreeSBC. Good. Okay. Well, um, it's been, uh, it looks like we're at the end of our questions here, and it's been a good um, uh, almost hour. Uh, so we're about at the end of our time slot here. So uh, just a couple closing comments. Um, thank, first of all, I want to thank Elaine for sharing uh, your expertise um, and uh, appreciate all your, your effort in putting the, so putting the software together and managing the team that's doing that. Oh, you're welcome. Yep. And also our audience. I want to thank you for spending some time with us today. And I know many of you are uh, frequent visitors to our monthly webinars. I appreciate you uh, stopping in. Uh, and as you noted in the opening housekeeping, uh, you'll receive an email on the next day uh, with links to the slides and uh, a, re a recording on YouTube of today's event. Would love it if you um, go to the YouTube, our YouTube channel and subscribe, and that way you won't miss any of these uh, sessions going forward. And, uh, and do feel free to share this content with others in your network and we find it helpful. And with that, uh, that's it from here. I wish everyone a really great day uh, and uh, look forward to having you on another event. So thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you found this content useful. And don't forget to share this with any other your coworkers or others who might be interested. Also, don't forget to click on subscribe and there's links below.